All right, this is a time that will let all those that are 11 years old and below be dismissed to junior church. So we'll let them and the workers make their way out. If you would please, while they're making their way out, take your Bibles and open to the book of Mark, chapter number 16, or 14. Mark chapter number 14. Mark chapter number 14. <laughs> Someone sent me a video this week, and it was uh, a younger fella. He was making some video or something. I don't know exactly, but he was asking the question because uh, many of us, well, let me ask you, how many of you, you've gotten a drink out of a water hose at some time or another? Yeah. And uh, this, the, the guy was standing there asking a question like, was there not a sink available? And it, asking just like that, like this, some kind of, uh, with contempt. You know, and he's, he's standing there, he doesn't have a, a shirt on, he's got a little beanie on his head. And, uh, and then comes this lady on answering him and says, does anybody want to tell him? Does anybody? No, no. There, the reason being is when we were put outside, we were not allowed to come back in. <laughs> And she goes through this whole thing and things of that nature, even to a point, and some of you remember this. You remember it in the evening time, about 10 o'clock, there had come an announcement on the TV. It said, do you know where your children are? She said, there was a reminder that our parents had to be reminded they had kids. <laughs> you know? And so she goes, no, no, we weren't, <laughs> we weren't allowed to come back in. And it, it was just so comical at times because sometimes we look at things and, and I'm sure even our generation, uh, the generation before us, looked at us and said, you know, we, we're just not made out of decent material. And, uh, and as we look at some of the, the folks that, uh, I don't know, I, I don't know all the, uh, I think, uh, uh, okay, remind me again, what generation are we supposed to be? Gen Z. No, no, ours. We are, we are Gen X, Generation X. We don't even, we don't, we don't even get a, a name, we just... We have to get a variable. Right, I, 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 yeah. And so uh, I can't keep up with all of them because, and one, I'm, I'm not going to. I intentionally add because I don't want to keep up with them. But uh, in that instance, there, there comes that point where we look at some of the crew and it's like, you know, we grew up where if, and I've, I, we've talked about it numerous times, just the different things that we went through where today they would just fall apart if they had to deal with some of those things. You know, if you, got, if you got bitten by a dog, all you were supposed to do is rub dirt on it and keep going. That's all. It's like, uh, you know, today, you know, there's lawsuits and everything. And I'm not saying you should. I'm not saying let your dog run around. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there's been a lot of things that, uh, uh, you know, we had to deal with on different things. Look, if, if you've never been shot with a BB gun or a pellet gun, you don't know what living is. You just don't. And uh, we used to give a, a toy was, was a slingshot. You understand that, don't you? And uh, we make fun because that little kid that wanted a Red Ryder BB gun, they kept saying, you're going to shoot your eye out. Because everybody know everybody got their eye shot at some point or another. There was one comedian that uh, was reminding us that uh, once in a while you got your nickname by something that happened. And uh, one fella, he said that uh, his, his buddy's name was Clock because he had one hand that was shorter than the other. And, uh, and so they called him Clock his whole life. And uh, another guy had uh, gotten his eye put out with a BB gun, and so he was called Pointer. And uh, our a aim, Aimer, that's what they called him, Aimer, excuse me. And, uh, and the teacher asked him, because one day they were in like third grade, and somebody called out, and the teacher called out his real name. It was like Keith or something like that. And everybody's wondering, who's Keith? Who's Keith? And, uh, and so he raised his hand. And everybody said, did you know that Amer's name was Keith? And the teacher, and so the kid said, you can call me Amer. And, uh, and he had, you know, he had one eye. And the teacher said, well, why do they call you Amer? And he goes, and he says, uh, oh, okay. And uh, just a, a host of things that uh, usually that's, that's how we grew up. And uh, in that instance, it's, we use those things for references at times. Because that means that we grew up thinking a particular way. <laughs> Even yesterday, we were, uh, we were Wesley and I, were, we, we were engaged in some activity that some folks would 
not be happy with. Uh, but uh, we were out just, we were just shooting ammunition. That's all we were doing. And uh, just, uh, <laughs> you say, what were you shooting at? Well, after we obliterated the, the, uh, the, the actual, well, Brother John Skid <laughs> and, the, uh, and, a, and a target, then it was just, eh, we just want to feel the percussion of this ballistic. That's all it is. And uh, so and it's how you, how you think about things. But I was sitting there and he had mentioned something and I said, well, sometimes you've got to thin the herd. That's all there is. To, and so I'm not saying, but uh, society at a times, it's like we didn't have all the precautions that are on today. Like there, there was actually a, a friend that was up in uh, Wisconsin. Now, they sometimes have to do this, but uh, on the snowblowers, it reminded them this is not for... Uh, for internal use or something or another along those lines. And, but uh, it, it, they have to use them sometimes on their, on their roofs and different things like that. But there's so many precautions and so many things that as we think today, it's like, is that really necessary? Well, the reason being is there's probably been a lawsuit and cost somebody money. Every last one of us know about the lawsuit of the lady that burned herself on McDonald's coffee and the lawsuit that took place. And, uh, and so every single cup you get now says, caution, hot, caliente. You know, it's like, well, yeah, if it's cold, I don't want it. It's how we think. But scripture reminds us that sometimes how we think is important. Because the truth is, scripture reminds us, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So that is a reminder that how we think sometimes is going to dictate how we believe and how we do things about our daily lives. Now in Mark chapter number 14, there is the events that are taking on here and Jesus is uh, teaching his disciples some wonderful lessons. But there is also the event that takes place that he now has lived his life, he has gathered his disciples, and now there's some bad things that are going on because of how people are thinking the truth is they're getting ready to bring accusation against a very innocent man. It's interesting how they do those. And it's interesting what takes place in the question that is asked. And we want to look at that just a little bit this morning. If you found Mark chapter number six, 14, excuse me, we're going to read verses 54 through 64. I know it sounds like a lot, but they'll go very quickly. So if you found Mark chapter number 14, we're going to read verses 54 through 64 this morning. So if you found that, could we stand for the reading of God's word? Mark chapter number 14, beginning in verse number 54, and we'll read down through verse number 64. I'll read the first verse, if you'll join me on the next, and we'll read down. Beginning in verse number 54, the Bible says, And Peter followed him afar off, even into the palace of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. And the chief priests and all the council sought for witness against Jesus to put him to death and found none. For many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. And there arose certain and bear false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple and is, uh, that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did their witness agree together. And the high priest stood in the midst of, and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it that thou, uh, excuse me, what is it which thou witness against thee? But he held his peace and answered nothing. Again the high priest asked him and said unto him, Art thou the Christ, the Son of the blessed? And Jesus answered, I am. And ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of the power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes and said, What need we any further witnesses? Ye have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. I want you to notice verse number 64. The three little words that are placed there. You've heard the blasphemy. What think ye? So he is asking that very question at this point. They said, You've, you've heard finally his own words. Now what do you think? In this instance, there's a, been a group of people. They've been trying to bring things against him, but they really couldn't find anything. Finally, they had to use the truth against him, as they have at many other times. And at that point, but it is a reminder of this. How you think is oftentimes going to dictate actions that follow. So this morning, I want to talk to us about that very thing. 
What think ye? Father, I do ask that you'd please help us today. Thank you again, Lord, for the importance of thy word. And I do ask that you'd please give us clarity today to accomplish your will. Thank you again for all that you do. And Lord, we do ask that you'd please just meet the needs in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The truth is, when I was beginning to uh, just think and pray about the, the week, and uh, starting, of course, early last week, and uh, uh, I, I happened to be at the, uh, uh, I, was, I was at the gas station, and I saw somebody, and I immediately had a thought of whether it was good or bad. I immediately thought something. And in that instance, I, I began to think, I, I don't know that person. Why in the world would I think that? I see the exterior and I, I see uh, how maybe they're, they've presented themselves or how they dress or whatever the case may be. And I immediately had a thought. All of us do it. We really do. That's why scripture reminds us that, uh, yes, uh, we can't see someone's heart. Scripture reminds us in 1 Samuel that God looketh on the heart because man looks on the outward appearance. And that is a reminder to us that we need to make sure that the outside represents the inside. But it also means that sometimes we can't judge a book completely by its cover. Now, we oftentimes do, and, uh, and that's why they try to make a very, <laughs> a very strong statement when they're making book covers so that you'd be interested and look at it. But the truth is, what think ye? Why do we think certain things about certain instances and about certain reports and about certain people and about certain things? We need to make sure that we evaluate that we are thinking clearly, justly, and right. Because otherwise, we're going to come up with a, a, an answer just like they did. Because the truth is, the question came in verse number 64, You have heard the blasphemy, what think ye? And they all condemned him to be guilty of death. Huh. Was there, was there a, a validation for it? No. Was he guilty of wrong? No. Was he guilty of telling them the truth? Yes. But yet all of them in unison agreed he's guilty. Is he guilty for answering the question? Yes. Is he guilty for answering it correct? Yes. Is he guilty for the truth? Yes. But the truth is they were trying to do something against him. And so they had to ask, what do you think? And uh, the question comes back. They thought him guilty. Were they thinking correctly? No. Were they thinking justly? No. So I wonder how many times you and I begin to think something immediately because of something we see or something we perceive, and we're not right. I can remember I was, uh, I was with my brother. It's been a number of years ago, and we were uh, uh, down around the, uh, uh, well, we actually lived uh, in Winchester at the time, and he and I were over towards the Muncie area, and uh, in that instance, we were over there, and uh, we were getting on the highway, and a, a bunch of fellas, and uh, they were, uh, it was a Saturday, they were on their motorcycles, there was a whole group of them, and, uh, and they began to ride, and he said something to the degree of, just look at them. And I looked at him and said, what are we looking at? He said, well, just look at them. I said, okay, what did they do? Well, nothing. Well, why in the world am I looking at them then? He says, well, I don't know. <laughs> I said, well, well, why are you all of a sudden just determining that there's something wrong with that? Or I said, are we supposed to evaluate the expense of their, their Harleys and all the rest of it? He said, well, they're just... Uh. And so we had to... Dis and I sat there and discussed for just a little bit. And uh, we just talked a little bit. It's like, we don't know them. We make a quick judgment immediately about something that we really know very little about. And yet we're really to, willing to make a judgment call along those lines. But God wants you and I to understand very clearly that what we think sometimes, and by the way, we will oftentimes think something long before we act upon something. And that's why Satan wants to influence your thinking. That's why in 1 Corinthians it says, bringing every thought into the obedience of Christ. Reason being is this, your thoughts are going to be manipulated and influenced on a regular basis. And when you and I give an open avenue for them to be influenced, by the way, sometimes they come in different manners. They will come through songs that you hear. They will sometimes come in conversations that you are listening to, sometimes come from a broadcast that you may be listening to. It may come in a number of different avenues, but it will adjust your thinking. 
as I uh, listen sometimes to some of the, the dissertations, and uh, if you ever want to uh, sit through a mind-numbing event, listen to some congressional discussions at times. It is, uh, uh, nobody will answer a question, and I'm thinking, no wonder nobody can get anything done. Nobody will answer a question, yes or no. Nobody will answer truthfully. Everybody tries to skirt everything as frustrating as it can be. And it's like, wow, that is ridiculous. Their mama should have smacked them around when they were a kid for not answering. But they have learned how to <laughs> discreetly not answer a question, which is frustrating to no end. But I wonder sometimes if we do that with our own thinking as far as to try to stay away from an absolute and right. In this manner... I began to just jot things down just a little bit. And I asked myself this question, what is the first thought when you see someone? What is the first thought when you see someone? Because when you first see them, you're going to evaluate somewhat of who they are, where they're at, so on and so forth. As the uh, uh, story goes one time, uh, and, and a song was even written about it. They had, uh, the, the auctioneer had picked up an, an old violin. Some of you remember the song. And they had uh, offered, uh, you know, to sell it. Nobody wanted to bid on it. Nobody wanted the, uh, and so pretty soon it, the price began to drop and drop. And pretty soon it was just, you know, just a few dollars for this old violin. Well, there came a, an old man and said, may I, may I see that just for a second? And he took just a moment and he drew the string across. And of course it made a, a weird sound. But all of a sudden he held it up to his chin he placed his fingers on the string and began to play an amazing melody. That old violin that was just a few dollars, all of a sudden the auctioneer said, now who will pay for it? And all of a sudden the price began to go up, up and up and up and up. And the whole conjecture of, uh, the, whole conjecture of the entire song was this. Because the touch from the master's hand showed how valuable that instrument was, it made a difference to everybody. I wonder sometimes when we look at an individual and we begin to consider who they are, how they're dressed, how they present themselves, that we sometimes have a thought that something is, is of lesser value. I think it's bad on our part because we should not esteem ourselves better than anybody else. But I've jotted down three things that you and I need to make sure that we do on a regular basis so that when what think ye comes into play that we can honestly make sure that we're in control of our thoughts and not Satan's influence as far as around us. We need to make sure that we determine that we will think correctly about something that is in front of us because otherwise we will be influenced for wrong and we will begin to act wrongly because we have determined or judged wrongly. So let me give you three things. They're very simple to tell you the truth. Number one, think kindly. Think kindly. In other words, how would you like to have somebody think about you? Because understand, just as you're evaluating somebody, and believe me, it's sometimes comical and fun. It really is. If you want to enjoy a time, look, you can go to the circus. You can go to uh, the different, uh, the King's Island. You can go to the Cedar Point. You can go to the Six Flags. And you can ride the Whirly Whirl and the Zip de Zip and the Zoom de Zoom and, and, uh, and throw up and all the rest of it. But it can't be as much fun as sitting in the Walmart parking lot. Because sometimes the things that, that and, and then you begin to make scenarios all along because you see a husband and wife as they're walking in and you can begin to give voices to each one of them. Now, I'm not saying you should do that. I'm just saying that sometimes that, that, that's what you can do. And uh, you can give them names. And so, because guess what? You're probably being evaluated in the same manner in some instance. So keep in mind that if you're going to think kindly the best that you can, keep in mind that that kindness will come back to you. Because when you think kindly, you are then expressing the fact of, I don't want to bring an unjust judgment against somebody because I don't know who they are. I don't know the circumstances that surround what they're doing, where they're at, the circumstances, because that's unjust, that's unfair, and that's not kind. So the very first thing that you and I need to do is remember that Ephesians chapter number four and verse number 32 is still in scripture. It really is. Does anybody off the top of your head know what that verse happens to say? Ephesians chapter, okay, even the beginning of it. You want to give it a shot? There's a lot of, a lot of involved with that. And be ye kind one to another, 
tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, or even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Because God is reminding us of this. He could have easily said, yes, he's guilty. And every one of us would have had to admit, yep, I am. They said, he is worthy of death. And we'd have to admit, yes, we are. You're going to face judgment that you cannot pay for. I know. But Jesus steps up with kindness and love and looks through eyes of compassion at somebody that was terribly unworthy and said, I'll save them so they don't have to. Even for God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you and I. If we did not receive the kindness that God extended our way through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we would be, as Scripture says, of all men miserable. Most miserable. And God reminds us very carefully that you and I must make sure that we think as we should. And sometimes the thinking process means that you and I need to think kindly. Because there's plenty of times that somebody could look at you and I and think, I don't like them. Now they may not. And they may find out later on there's a good reason why not to like us. But the truth is, I would like to have the benefit of the doubt. Have you and I give somebody the benefit of the doubt when we first interact with them, cross paths with them, or, or look and see them? Or do we quickly pass judgment immediately? Think kindly. By the way, I think this is a wonderful thing to begin to teach family, whether it's children, whether it's in classrooms, or whatever the case may be. But there needs to be some kindness that's extended. Because aggression is easy. Unkindness comes naturally. But the truth is, if God is saying this, in Philippians chapter number 2 and verse number 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, then that means that you and I are going to have to purposely do things justly. We're going to have to purposely do things kindly. God could have easily destroyed the world. I, I was thinking just the other day as uh, Brother Pat was preaching up here, as he was reminding us of the fact that the Lord Jesus did what was necessary to pay for your sins and mine. It's still amazing to me that as he was led as a lamb to the slaughter, he didn't say a word. And I'm glad he didn't. I'm glad that he could have, and as I've said before, just with one word of, of uh, request from heaven, it would have emptied. And everything that you and I know would have been just destroyed in a, just completely in just a, a, a split second, probably less than that. Look, if one angel is going to be able to bind Satan for a thousand years and have those chains, could you imagine what a whole host of angels could do? It wouldn't take it. But if our Lord, while he was hanging on the cross, would have said one word, and I've told you before because I, I think about it on many occasions, if he had said, help, you and I would have had no hope. Every sacrifice that had been made in the Old Testament would have been for naught. Everything that we would have needed for the future would have been gone. But because he was willing to look through those eyes of compassion and look at you and I kindly, he could do what was necessary to be our Savior. Think kind. Think kindly. Number two. Number two. Think positively. Think positively. In other words, how could I help it? make that person a better person? How can I help make this circumstance or this situation better? How can I be a blessing in the midst of all of these things if I can? Now there's some in, in plenty of instances that you cannot. And uh, for instance, I, uh, when, uh, if, if I happen to be watching a program and all of a sudden they, they, uh, they, I, I, I find it hard. I, uh, uh, on occasion, we have because of uh, just one of the channels that we get, we get to uh, uh, Jewish television. In other words, it, it's JLTV. And they have a lot of things about, about Israel news and things of that nature and, and some of the foods and different things. And I watch that. But one of the, the sponsors of that is the, is the Shriners. And uh, some of you know who they are. They, they try to help uh, take care of, of uh, young children that have disabilities and that have diseases and things of that nature. It's hard for me to watch. It really is. And, uh, and as, I, as I watched the little ones that are, that are struggling and ailing, just the other day, Brother Caleb sent me a picture of, of uh, little Chloe Rochester that's three years old that we've been praying about that, that has cancer. And the truth is the, uh, the doctors are very concerned, and so are their parents. 
And as, uh, as I see that, uh, it, it just breaks my heart. It just does. And I, ca I can't do a great deal about all the, all the maladies that come from a physical ailment. And I can't uh, change a great deal of them, but I can go to my Heavenly Father and I can say, Lord, I know that uh, when I was first born, the difficulties that I faced and how the hospital and the staff took care of me and uh, how that they tried to help along those lines to do what was necessary. And God, I ask that you'd please take care of them. Physically, I can't do anything. Monetarily, I could do very little. But Lord, you can do amazing things. And I ask that you'd please be very real to them. And that's what I ask. Think positively. Instead of looking at somebody with disgust, why don't we sometimes think, God, please help them. Please do what is necessary to get them to the Savior. God, help me to be the influence that I can be. Help me to do what I should do. Think positively. Instead of the negative, instead of, ah, they're never going to amount to anything, it could very well be true. I don't know. But I don't want to be the one that casts that judgment. I would rather be the one that says, Lord, I think they could, might be able to do amazing things. And they may be something that, uh, that could be of great value to somebody somewhere in some instance. I don't know. But God, you do. And I want to think positively. Now, it's not always easy. And that's why I have to purposely try to do that sometimes. I'm on our roads out here. And there are a lot of people doing a lot of strange things on the roads these days. And, uh, and sometimes it's not always the safest thing. And, uh, but at the same token, I, I've got to remember, there's somebody that drives that vehicle that somebody loves. And, uh, and I, I, I can get impatient. I can. I, because I think I've got, a, I've got a task and a job to do, and I'm trying to get it done. And, uh, and I know somebody's trying to scroll through Facebook while they're driving. I can see it. I can look down and I can say, amen, Brother Andy, you can see it happening. It is, and there's plenty of things. And anymore, they have screens that are not just a little phone thing. I mean, these things are big and it's like, <laughs> you know, and they're scrolling and all the rest of it. And it's like, uh, there's a whole windshield you need to be paying attention to. But in that instance, I try to think positively. And I try to say, Lord, if, if something happens to them, somebody, somebody somewhere will care. Somebody somewhere will be heartbroken and somebody somewhere would, would be very devastated. It could be that that's somebody's mother. It could be that it's somebody's uh, sister or brother. It could be that that's somebody that somebody deeply cares about. And, uh, and so in that instance, think positively. And then lastly, number three, think this. They are loved. They are loved. Because my thoughts... As I begin to adjust them, it is a reminder, what think ye? I have to remember, there's, there may be some family member that loves them. Every single Wednesday night, every single Wednesday night, I get that prayer list and I look at it. I've read the names that are on it, but I don't know every name that's on it. But as I kneel down over here, I say, Lord, I don't know all of them, but there's somebody that knows them. There's a whole family connected to them. I said, there's somebody that cares and knows or otherwise they wouldn't be on this list. And there's somebody that is asking for prayer for them. And I ask that you please take care of them and influence them and be good to them. And I ask that you please do what is necessary to show your mercy and grace. I, I, almost every single week of the world, that's almost the exact verbatim words that I say when I kneel down over here. The very first thing, because every single name that's on our prayer list, you know them. I don't know them personally, but you do. And because of that, they are loved by you. And that means that they deserve to have some attention and their name brought to the throne room of grace. They are loved. They're loved by a family. They may be loved by a child. They may be, as, as honorary as somebody may be, there may be little hands that squeezes their face and calls them mother or dad or, or is grateful to see them. As Memorial Day has, uh, is upon us, and as the, sometimes the different videos that happen to come up at different times as you're scrolling through things, one thing that, that gets me every single time, every time, and I, I, don't, know, I, I don't know why, but then again, I, I do know that it's these uh, service personnel and they may be in their, their dress uniform or they may be in fatigues or they may be in something, but they go to the schoolhouse and uh, where their child is and there's... All of you have seen them and you've watched them as family members have been deployed for months and as they finally are able to come home and that young person that hasn't seen their, 
their mother or father now for months, all of a sudden turns around and there they are. They don't worry a great deal about decorum. They don't worry a great deal about what anybody else thinks. They don't worry about whether the teacher is going to holler at them or anything else. They run. They see their loved one and they grab them, they hug them. And sometimes they don't know how to react and so they're just emotional because they're just happy that that person that they love is there. They just love them. So I, re, I have to remember that whoever it is, what think ye, think this, they are loved. Not only by, by family, but also by our Lord. If nothing else in the entire world can get your attention to think that they are loved, remember this. Jesus shed his blood for that individual. You may look at them and say they don't deserve it, and you may very well be right. You may look and say they have done evil things and they may have to face judgment and they will face our Lord in that, in that manner. But remember, he was still willing to lay his hand down on that cross and have that nail driven through it for them. You say, well, they don't deserve it, I know, but he loved them. And when I have to go to him and I say, Lord, he says, I, I, I know what your need is, but right now they need me more. But Lord, I, I, you understand that, you know, I, I, I stub my toe on the bed and I need you to hear about it. He says, I know, but they're facing a great deal more. I know, but, and he has to look at you and I and has to remind us, I love you. I say, thank you. He says, but I love them also. I can't understand it sometimes. And to tell you the truth, as I stand here today, there's sometimes I look at people and I know I'm supposed to love them in that instance. The only way that I can do it is this. I have to be reminded that because my Jesus loved them, I have to love them. Do I like their actions? No, I do not. Do I think they deserve some of the punishment that may come their way? I, I do. Do I think that there ought to be some remorse and retribution and things about something that maybe they have done? Yes. But I still have to remember that Jesus loves them. Because the, with the same love that he loved me is the very same love that's going to lift them someday too. And so if nothing else, I have to remember this. What think ye? I can allow hatred to come into my heart. I can. I can allow evil to come into my heart if I so choose. But that evil begins to get into other areas of my life too. It begins, it begins to frustrate in the areas and begins to make it very much so that I don't want people to be saved. I have to admit that I've actually come to the Lord and I've actually said in my heart, Lord, I don't care if they get saved or not. To my detriment, not to my benefit and to my shame, I've said that. Because when I have to look at him and say, Lord, I don't want your blood to cover their sins, he says, I do. And if I had to do it again, I would. And I would say, Lord, I don't think they're worthy. He says, but you weren't either. But Lord, I went to church. He says, there's a lot of people that are going to say unto me on that day, but Lord, did not we prophesy in thy name? Yet I will have to say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. But in that instance, I have to say, Lord, if you love them, I'll do the best that I can to love them also. Think kindly, think positively, and think they are loved. Whether it's by family or whether it's by no one else but our Lord, they are loved. What think ye? What think ye? If you and I don't allow ourselves to think as we should, we will allow ourselves then to be influenced by he who ha has very evil thoughts. Satan himself will try to influence you. You and I need to make sure that we do our part to try to make sure that we think of this world, our fellow man, and those around us with kindness with positivity, and with the fact that they are loved by the Savior. We need to make sure that we think, what think ye? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, thank you again for the blessings that you give. And Lord, I do ask that you'd please just help today to accomplish your will. And Lord, I do ask that you'd please just work now to accomplish the things that we should for thy sake. In just a second, where it stands with our heads bowed, with our eyes closed, the question comes to you and I, what think ye? When you see someone today or when you see somebody this week or maybe this past week and you've seen them, what do you think? 
She said, well, I, I really didn't think much. Could you think kindly? Could you think positively? How could you be a blessing? How could you be a help? And could you be reminded that your Savior loved them and they need to hear the gospel? In that instance, that reminds us all that we need to be very aware of how we think because that root of bitterness will set in if we're not careful. Our pride will get the best of us. Just as Saul himself, he thought he was bigger than what he should have. And in that instance, God said, I've rejected him. In that instance, it is a reminder to you and I, we need to make sure that we adjust our thinking as we should. Let's all stand with our heads bowed, with our eyes closed. As the instruments begin to play, if God spoke in your heart this morning, the altar is open. You may come.